My dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. If a man enters your church wearing an expensive suit and a street person wearing rags comes in right after him, and you say to the man in the suit, sit here, sir, this is the best seat in the house, and either ignore the street person or say, better sit here in the back row. Haven't you segregated God's children and proved that you are judges who can't be trusted? Listen, dear friends, isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? He chose the world's down and out as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. This kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God. And here you are abusing these same citizens. Isn't it the high and mighty who exploit you, who use the courts to rob you blind? Aren't they the ones who scorn the new name Christian used in your baptisms? You do well when you complete the royal rule of the scriptures. Love others as you love yourself. But if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and stand convicted by it. You can't pick and choose in these things, specializing in keeping one or two things in God's law and ignoring others. Good morning to all of you. I'm so glad to see you and that we could come together on this great day. Uh, just to be here, to be a part of uh, life together, and then to share a meal. That is just absolutely perfect. So I'm glad the fall is beginning and we can begin this way. Uh, before I forget it, FYI, your former pastor's birthday is today. I saw on Facebook, Aaron's, what, 85th birthday. I don't know what it is, but Aaron's birthday is today, and we give thanks to God for him. I wrote this week in thinking about preaching that text that was just read from the second chapter of James. I began to think about the way in which the world is ordered. It's been this way since I've been alive. It's been this way in every community that I've lived a part of. There's another world out there, and we are insulated from it by our place in the world. That's a simple statement. But it's to recognize that we live in one world, and there's another world out there that we paid no attention to. We're protected by our jobs and the income of those jobs and the stability that's created by them. We're insulated by our education, our financial advantage, which comes from having a career, and we're even protected from the other world by the provincial traditions of our faith. Even religion has a way of maintaining those that are welcome and those that are not so welcome. It's a world of privilege and complicity our world shields us from the other world. This world that we're a part of shields us from that other world that's right here in our own community and keeps us in our place. That's another aspect of it, while keeping others from the other world in their place. A few years ago, evangelical Christianity, and that's sort of a catch-all phrase because it uh, it's catch-all from the standpoint that it's very uh, conservative, we might call it right-wing religion, we might call it fundamentalism, it has different names, but evangelical Christianity picked on one of its own stars a while back, and a four-person tribunal was appointed to question Tony Campolo. Do you know Tony Campolo? It's been a while, he's not quite fully retired, but he, for a while there, he was traveling all over the country, teaching and preaching and speaking. He's quite an amazing man, and he would share stories. He was an amazing storyteller. He would tell a story that would be 
so well done and so funny you would start crying from laughter. Or he would tell a story that was so sorrowful you might, you might cry out of sadness. He had this capacity of telling an amazing story. And no matter at this tribunal what polite proprieties were observed, it ended up being a heresy trial. This four-person tribunal group was trying to figure out whether Tony Campolo could be accused of being a heretic. Can you imagine that? Very conservative. He was conservative like they were up to a point. And it was the result of literalistic right-wing Christianity holding court over a conservative. Tony Campolo is anything but a conservative, but not a fundamentalist. And he was a professor. He was not a preacher. And Campolo had stirred up the ire of these right-wing believers by telling a story that had occurred. For years, Tony Campolo, who taught at a, a Christian university in Philadelphia, I believe, would take students down to uh, Haiti. Haiti is widely understood to be the most, uh, what, the most uh, tragically hit with poverty. It's the worst poverty in the Western Hemisphere, they say. And Campolo, rather than to sit in a classroom, you know, big lecture hall like this, and talk about poverty, rather he loaded students up and they flew down to Haiti. They would fly in through Fort Lauderdale on a jet. And then in Fort Lauderdale, they would get onto a twin prop airplane and fly to Haiti. Now, if you go in through uh, Port-au-Prince, you will end up on a big jet and you'll have a, a nice runway and they have an airport there. But if you fly into the northern part of Haiti to the little town of Cap Haitian, there's no runway. There is a, there is a mowed, a mown field. And the jungle is right there. And the, the uh, airport is just a shack. I mean, you kind of walk through it, show your papers and your ticket, and you, you're walking on the grass field to get out to your plane. I know this because I had a chance to go to Haiti and do this very trip with a group of high school kids from my church. It was amazing. Immediately, you're thrown into the destitution of Haiti. There's, it's not uh, covered up by a nice uh, airport. It's not covered up with people who are trying to take care of you. You have to take care of yourself. The airport in Cap Haitian uh, has a metal shack for a terminal. It was back backward and it was low tech. And at the end of their week of being in Capation and being a part of communities there, uh, Tony Campolo and these students, what they ended up doing was meeting back at the airport, the little runway, and to get ready to load up on their plane. And out of the jungle, no fence, nothing to hold back people from coming out of the jungle. Out of the jungle, a woman ran out onto the airfield holding her little baby. And she immediately ran to the college students. Can't you imagine these lovely college students who were there and they were studying, they were talking about poverty. And she ran up to them and held out her baby and said, please take my baby, take my baby. Can you imagine what these college kids thought about that? It was stunning, it was, it was more than they could imagine. She held out her baby to them as a sign that she was deadly serious about her request. There was nothing fake about this request she was screaming out. Campolo understood immediately what was taking place. He understood the nature of poverty. He understood the likelihood that this woman not only had this baby, but had other children back in her home. And she knew that she couldn't afford to take care of one more child. 
And sh rather than the, the family itself suffering from, from hunger and for this baby not to be supported, she ran out to approach the college students. And this woman had to be restrained. The officials came out and held her back. While the students climbed onto the plane, they got onto the plane, the, the door was closed, and she broke free and ran up to the airplane as it is moving into place on this field to get ready to take off. And she's yelling at them and holding out her baby. Please take my baby. Ken Polo made a transformative experience out of this for himself. He had been there before. He knew the stakes. He understood the nature of poverty. And he looked into the face of this woman and into the face of her infant child. And he, <coughs> pardon me, he recognized he was not looking into the face of a, a mother and her young child. He was looking into the face of Jesus. This is a theological interpretation of an experience that he was having. He said it mattered not to him whether she was a Christian or whether she was a worshiper of the primitive animistic religions offering sacrifices in the jungle. All he could see, all his eyes were able to see was this young child and this woman and hearing, hauntingly hearing the words of Jesus, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. This is where this story moves from the, the circumstances that are right in front of them and now becomes an opportunity for him and for the students to reimagine their own understanding of the world. For Campolo, when he looked into the desperate eyes of this mother offering up her child, he was looking into the face of God. This is theological thinking at his part. What is it that Christianity is trying to teach me that I have not paid much attention to? You know, in the, uh, in the theology of humanity, one of the guiding thoughts is uh, Imago Dei. The image, Imago Dei, God. The image of God that is woven into and implanted into every human who is created. No matter their race, no matter their language, no matter their physical capabilities or not, every person is created in the image of God. And when Campolo looked into the desperate eyes of this mother, offering up her child. He was looking into the face of God. Was it heresy? That's what the trial was all about. Was Tony Campolo guilty of being a heretic? Or was it the struggle of faith in the face of extreme poverty? When we read these words from James, we realize our problem is that of recognition that when we see others, that we include the reality that they're created in the image of God, no matter their ethics, no matter their language, no matter about their race, the truth of God calls out to us to simply see one another as God sees us. We are children of God created in the image of God and not one of us is better than another. When that truth settles in, when we begin, when that dawns on us in our consciousness of bringing forward the way we see the world with our faith and bringing those and molding them together, we'll have a different way of seeing the world. It's a very challenging thing. It's very hard for us to do. No matter what country we hail from or what part of the world we call home, God calls us to love one another, no matter our gender, no matter our orientation in life, not one thing elevates one of us over another. Here's how the United Church of Christ says it. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. 
When I first began to hear that about 15 years ago, it became a compelling idea of God. I wanted my church to be just like that. I wanted me to be like that. It was compelling from the standpoint it gave me a rationale for uh, moving into the United Church of Christ as a minister, an authorized minister. This is what pulled the trigger for me. And the question is, is, if it can't be true in the church, where will it be so? If we can't achieve that here, where will it be achieved? One of my haunting memories is from the very first church that I pastored in San Antonio. Uh, to say I was a rookie would be accurate. Uh, I was in a church that was in a neighborhood not too far from downtown and for about 40 years, it was in an elegant, lovely neighborhood. And then about 10 years before I arrived, it began to change. The city of San Antonio, of course, is the majority of citizens are Hispanic. That neighborhood, which had been an upper end, upper middle class, white neighborhood, over that decade transitioned into being widely Hispanic. My church was right in the middle of it. And we began to realize that we would have to create a different church if we were going to minister in that community in the future. We tried everything. We tried all kinds of things to make that happen. Finally, we had a strategic decision uh, with uh, Primera Iglesia Bautista of San Antonio, First Mexican Baptist Church about merging. They were down in the King William district and they couldn't grow because the, you know, the historical committee said they couldn't add anything. They were tapped for space. We had tons of space and our membership was down. We talked about merging together and to become an Anglo-Hispanic or Hispanic Anglo congregation. We were going to, to merge the two cultures. They already had an English service. We would join with that. And then they had a bigger service with Hispanics. The, two, the pastor and I were going to co-pastor. This is our vision of this. We had lots of conversations about how to do this. Eventually, they turned into conversations with the church itself. I talked with my church. He talked with his church. And we had a series of meetings along about a month's period of time. I remember distinctly being in this church conversation that we had. And the oldest deacon in the church was 93 or 4 maybe. And he stood up and he said, I understand we will be in, uh, we will be in heaven together for eternity. But do we have to start now? It is kind of funny, and then it's desperately sad for him to articulate what others were thinking and feeling. He couldn't help himself. Do we have to start now? Do we have to merge? That was a very, very poignant moment in the life of the church, and the issue of racism came up. On the other side of town, the Hispanic congregation, they actually passed this resolve. And then several of their deacons, their leaders, went to their pastor and threatened him with a lawsuit. And they killed the, the deal. It just collapsed. All that conversation just collapsed. And, uh, you know, that's the way it is, maybe even in church. Folks, the kingdom beyond will be filled with strangers if we don't open our eyes to the wide net God is casting in the world. It will ultimately be a community of God's children from all over the globe gathered together. There will be people that you don't expect to be there. And the truth of the matter is, we'll have a hard time understanding. We may be in chaos, and it'll be a family so diverse that it will have one of everything. 
It will be a family where no child is thought differently than any of the rest because we all know that we are God's favorite. God bless us as we think about our ministry in the world. God bless us to be brave and to live our faith. Amen.